everyone and welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Book Club. Today is Saturday, October 12th, and I'm James May, Program Officer and today's moderator. I'm pleased to see you all here today. Welcome. Um, if this is your first time at Book Club um, and you'd like to be kept informed about up club, upcoming Book Club sessions, please drop a message in the chat. As always, um, we will add you to our mailing group. We're also monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you uh, you can drop messages to Drea and she will forward them. Um, today is the second and final session of our book, The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's Wartime Quest to Build One World by Dr. Sandy Zip. I will introduce Sandy in a few moments, but first, as always, we have a little bit of housekeeping. So we're recording today's session. The video will, will, will be available on CGS's YouTube channel uh, by the mid of next week. That will take uh, a few minutes to briefly introduce uh, the book uh, over about 10 to 15 minutes with the intention of allowing a little bit more time than usual for questions and conversation. So therefore, we'll, there will be uh, two rounds of questions this week. However, as usual, I will ask you to uh, keep your questions or comments to two minutes for each round. If you exceed that time, I will interject and ask you to wrap up. Does everyone agree to the uh, community agreement about the Q&A? Good, excellent. So um, you can raise your hands virtually or physically uh, or put your questions in the chat box. I'll come to you on a first come, first served basis. We'll stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. That'll be around 1.20 for any announcements that you may wish to make about other relevant issues or other programming uh, that you'd like to raise uh, awareness of among the group. Please hold those kinds of comments until the end. Um, with housekeeping out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest author for today, Sandy Zip, who is the author of today's book, The Idealist Wendell Wilkie's Wartime Quest to Build One World. Sandy is a cultural and urban historian at Brown University. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, M Plus One, The Baffler, The Nation, and is the author of Manhattan Projects, The Rise and Fall, Fall of Urban Renewal, Cold War, New York. He has also uh, co-edited a collection of writings by Jane Jacobs. So with that, um, I, it's my pleasure to hand over to Sandy um, to take on today's session, which is session two of the book. Sandy. Thanks, James. I appreciate it. And hello to everyone. It's nice to see everyone again. I see a lot of familiar faces from last month and um, well, maybe all familiar faces from last month. Um, so that's great. Um, I, I thought today that, you know, I, I talked a lot about the... Um, the overall stakes of the book uh, in in my initial presentation to you all uh, last month, and and I thought maybe today I would just um, spend a little less time uh, me jawing and and telling you everything, um, and 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 more hearing from you. I, I'm really curious to hear what people thought about the book. I know there were a number of folks on the on the call last uh, month who had just started getting into the book, and hopefully you've gotten a little further by now. Um, we had, uh, Drea and James had uh, sort of divided this in half uh, in a kind of break at, um, I think we said a page 172, which is uh, chapter, um, the beginning of chapter nine, which finds us uh, it's sort of at the, the end of Wilkie's trip around the world in the fall of 1942. So last time we ostensibly covered uh, Wilkie's early life, uh, the 1940 presidential campaign and the, his rise to, to national prominence. Um, and then the aftermath of the, that campaign and the beginnings of the years of the, uh, the early years of World War II, as he struggled to elaborate a, um, different perspective on the world and on national politics, uh, apart from that of his, the, the uh, from FDR, who had vanquished him in the 1940 election, uh, but the ways that his interests in doing so actually brought him together with FDR in a certain way uh, to launch this trip, um, and this trip that went around the world in 1942 uh, in uh, for 49 days in in the fall of 19, the, well, late summer and early fall of 1942, August, September, and October, um, <clears throat> right around this time, um, and was became a, a platform for him to try to carve out for himself a different view of the world than that espoused by his rival uh, Roosevelt and other um, avatars of of a then uh, renewing internationalism, finding new legs after its denouement in, in the post-Wilson years. 
uh, of the of the sort of iso quote unquote isolationist years of the uh, 1920s and 30s. That is, of course, a, a misnomer for many reasons. So we can get into that if you like. But so the first part of the book that we talked about last time, or that we were sort of surveying, although we didn't talk much about it in detail. So I'm happy to go to any of these places. Uh, really took Wilkie um, down the uh, down the East Coast to Brazil, across the Atlantic Ocean over into Africa, um, to Nigeria, to Sudan, to Egypt, uh, then up to Turkey, then down into um, what we call today Southwest Asia, and was of course called then the Near East or Middle East, um, to Jerusalem, to Baghdad, and to Tehran, um, and then uh, up north from Tehran to Moscow. Um, and in that uh, uh, chapter eight, uh, we find um, Wilkie spending almost two weeks in in the Soviet Union, um, encountering uh, Stalin, uh, waiting to encounter Stalin, as many visitors to the Soviet Union in those years had to do, um, but touring around the country, uh, touring the eastern front near Rzhev, um, um, seeing the war uh, uh, from a different perspective than many Americans would have seen it, and trying to um, find his way into some kind of rapprochement or imaginary rapprochement with um, Stalin uh, and trying to take advantage of a, a momentary thawing in the kinds of tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States that had launched back in 1919 with the revolution, but were now uh, perhaps at their most optimistic uh, period that they ever probably would get in some sense. Um, and Wilkie was there at that very moment, trying to wedge open some kind of new relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union um, so that he could clear the way uh, from uh, to find find a new uh, a new model really for world order that would not involve this kind of new would not devolve really into a kind of great power confrontation and standoff that of course it later did. Um, so that was the first half of the book, and then in the second half or the the part where we've divided it for our two sessions, we we find Wilkie flying um, east from the Soviet Union and into China. Um, in a route that many, um, that few people had flown in those years, touching down in places that few Americans had ever been, um, at least few or, or few Americans knew much about and certainly uh, had never flown into. Um, so we find him coming in through the east of China, and he saw a kind of, well, the west of China coming eastward into in, into China from, from uh, the Soviet Union, and finding a, a new world there that he found quite um, exciting. Uh, the story in uh, of what I of the chapter that I call the China Mystique is, um, uh, of course, not my phrase. Of course, a phrase that many people used to um, describe the uh, the ways that the myths and and ideals about China uh, tended to uh, bewitch Americans and to make them feel that they had uh, found a kind of kindred spirit, um, both through their own Orientalism and through. Um, a kind of idealism about the the vision of China that was being that was on display um, by the nationalist government, the Kuomintang government, uh, in those years. Um, and Wilkie was no exception to that. He was someone who was quite taken with the romance of China, um, but in a ways that I think are perhaps not always appreciated. The usual story by this point in Wilkie's trip is that he has essentially been gulled by the Chinese into a kind of un uncritical view of their uh, nationalist project and the corruptions of their nationalist project. And I think there's some truth to that, but there's also a way that what Wilkie is doing is trying to hold out some kind of um, room for the form of anti-imperialism that he encountered in both the Guomindang uh, camp and the, uh, the, the, the communist camp and with his meetings with Zhou Enlai. Um, in those, in, in, as he's in in Chongqing, in the in the, the capital there. So um, we see Wilkie in this kind of complex battle uh, with himself um, and with the, his own inclinations to be swept away by things that are um, quite exciting, um, particularly his reported affair with Madame Chiang Kai Shek, which gets a little bit of um, notice on my book, and everybody wants to ask me about that all the time. So we can return to that if everybody's that interested. I feel like maybe this audience is less interested in that little um, bit of gossip, but it was it's a it's a part of the book that um, that couldn't be ignored. Much uh, I think Wilkie's family was or his grandson was not so happy with me dallying on that front. But anyway, um, so I think in a lot of ways um, 
he takes from the Guomindang this kind of sense that there is the possibility, just as he did in a place like Turkey, um, for for making forms of nationalism into into internationalism, and he's sort of uh, per participating in a sense that there is a kind of world progress from nationalism to internationalism. That many people who are that many people in these years, right, revolutionaries, um, liberal and internationalists, right, see as a kind of um, logical uh, progress uh, of world order in these years. And Wilkie is, this is of course not Wilkie's idea, he is picking up on this all around him. Um, he is encouraged by many of the Chinese to go to India, but FDR has uh, forbidden him to go from India so as not to provoke a row with the British, which he was provoking anyway, as we see as Churchill, um, who had early on been quite a fan of Wilkie's because Wilkie visited the UK during the Blitz in 41, I think it was, and um, and had, they had become quite close as two gregarious sorts like those would have. But as Wilkie traveled here and particularly uh, brushed up against India and started talking too much about India, he really began to alienate. And also his his um, his his jaunt through the Middle East, he began to alienate um Churchill. So you see uh, Wilkie finding his way, his way into a lot of different disputes and a lot of different interesting politics in these years um, and carving out his own role um, in between the kind of conventional liberal uh, republicanism that he had come to inhabit as, as a sort of electoral figure and the old Wilsonian democratic um, internationalism that he had inhabited in his youth. Um, and he's trying to, he's pushing at the boundaries of both of those, and particularly the old Wilson Wilsonian idealism, he finds his way into a more anti-imperial and to some extent more sort of economically critical version of that um, world. To, here and there, and we can talk about that in more detail if you'd like. So he he, he finishes his trip um, in China, flies home, and completes his journey around the world, returning in 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 um in the end of 1942. And then the the book takes on two chapters. The book uh, has two chapters about um, essentially what happens in the aftermath of his his trip, uh, and tries to recover for American history. Um, the story of the impact of the book One World and some of the activity that Wilkie is involved in in the immediate aftermath of the trip of, before One World is published. So really the period sort of from the, the fall of 1942 um, and then all the way through the election of 1944. And Wilkie's place in this, this what of course in, in retrospect is a very short period of time, but in some ways a very consequential part, part of, uh, um, period of time, taking us from the end of Wilkie's trip to um, let's say the Dumbarton Oaks Conference in 1944 at the time that Wilkie dies. Um, and then I have, of course, a conclusion that tries to um, assess the significance of the idea of one world and its reverberations throughout the 20th century down to our own time in a sort of shorthand. Uh, there are no doubt many more books to be written about that problem um, and that question. So that's the... Um, that's the the arc of this second half of the book. In many ways, what the second half of the book does is turn from a story about Wilkie's travels to a story about Wilkie's essential problem, which is a problem of trying to convince the United States and the people of the country, of, of his own country, that they can go with him on the a metaphorical journey, a political journey, similar to the one that he's just completed physically in traveling around the world and being exposed uh, to forms of opinion and understandings of world order and world thinking that he that they have they have barely glimpsed that many mainstream Americans his primary audience the sort of broad middle of American politics and culture have barely glimpsed in their newspapers in their um, in their in, in the media that they can they're consuming um, and so he's pushing and pulling at the at the kind of status quo the conventional wisdom to try to open up. Um, a different model for thinking the world in these years. And the challenges for him is not simply to be a worldly figure, but to figure out how to be an American figure who can bring home this worldly um, position, this worldly sensibility. Uh, and that's his dilemma. And um, ultimately, as I say in the second to last chapter, the, the Narrows of 1944 is the is the is the dilemma upon which his ideals uh, tended and ended up foundering. Um, and so 
this is the kind of denouement of the book. Uh, but also it's um, it's attempt to ask us to think about, and I may perhaps I talked about this last time, but to think about um, the usefulness of telling histories or stories of failure. Um, for the residue of ideas that they leave behind that perhaps um, were not taken up or fully taken up. I think this idea was absolutely, the idea of one world was absolutely taken up in this period. Um, but while it did not prevail as a full form of common sense for most Americans, it remains in American political culture, the ideal of interdependence, of the vision that the United States is interdependent with the world, that interdependence is a kind of condition in which we all live, whether we think globally or we think at other scales of relation, um, and that this is an idea that continues to live with us um, in various ways down to our own time and remains open um, for others to take up and do new things with. So this is the 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 way that I tried to address this book and to see Wilkie as a kind of both political and cultural figure, someone who advances in the realm of politics and ideas, a kind of sensibility about the world that um, communicated to many Americans in both not just logical ways, but in sort of what we in the business call effective ways, his sort of sensibility, his his sort of sense that he embodied this for Americans who could feel this relationship to the rest of the world through a figure like Wilkie, who 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 to though to many Americans seemed um, quintessentially American, while also uh, showing that they could he could reach out to the rest of the world in a way that um, that violated, but also sort of carefully pushed at the the kinds of sureties of American exceptionalism or American defensiveness or 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 American sense that they needed to go it alone in in the world. So that's the that's the basic arc of this last half of the book. I'd be happy to talk to any uh, talk about any little parts of it, any scenes, any things that that you all found interesting or puzzling or maybe wrong um, in the book. That would be interesting um, to know about. So I'm happy to uh, let's see, it's 1221. So yeah, I'm happy to take any any questions that, that folks have. Wonderful. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so we will now open up for questions. Um, as usual, we will go for uh, a time limit of two minutes per question uh, for your questions or comments. And we'll come to you on a first come first serve basis. You can put your questions in the chat. You can raise your virtual hand or you can raise your physical hand. Um, I will come to Rebecca first. She's got her hand up. See in the corner. Not a question. Um, I just wanted to thank Sandy so much for spending so much time with us. Um, as you can see, maybe um, the Peace Palace behind me, I normally have it as a virtual background, but I am actually in The Hague right now um, yeah. and regrettably unable to stay for the rest of this wonderful discussion. I look forward to to watching the video. Um, but yes, very much animated by, by the spirit of Wendell Wilkie as I've just come from a discussion of the third Hague Hague Peace Conference, which we're trying to convene here. Um, so have a wonderful discussion and apologies again that I cannot stay any longer. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Thank you Rebecca. Um, so with that said, um, I will go to Carla May. You've got your hand raised. Would you like to come next? Thank you. Thank you for your overview. Um, I just propose that you know, in my listening and and in, in hearing your overview once more, um, that what is that at, at stake here with him and with us is the the bottom the bottom perception that difference means competition. Difference as competition keeps us apart, keeps us in isolation keeps us in in privilege keeps us in in uh, superiority it can keep us in bigotry whereas difference as unifying making something better bigger greater with difference is something we have to be coaxed into mm -hmm. That, that our our own history, even as a nation, is reflecting this process. Yeah. That it was only going to be whites, educated and moneyed whites that would rule this country. Uh, 
the, the races were bad because they were different. Whereas we are a nation of difference. We are a nation of varied peoples with varied cultures, with varied treasures, with varied music, with varied foods, with varied worship. And we have made a nation that is a marvelous tapestry of difference making a unity. So I'll stop there. But these two ideas occurred to me that if they could be addressed and addressed directly, that when, when, the, when the mindset is that difference is disunifying or that difference is competitive, mm. we, we will stay in where we are or worse. Whereas if we would recognize what difference can cause as a greater something, a greater human reality, we're on a totally different trajectory. Yeah, I think that will, yeah, I think that's a really a really lovely way of putting it, um, Carla May. I think that there's a there's a sort of um this I, I guess I would put it this way. I think that's something that Wilkie himself struggled to try to enunciate. He didn't have, you know, this is this is at a moment in American history where um the ideas of you know, even that word difference that you evoked so nicely there, right, is a, is, is a product of a kind of post-civil rights understanding of the United States for, for mainstream audiences, for liberal and mainstream audiences. Um, and this, you know, back in the 1940s, when Wilkie is uh, getting uh, going and, and, and learning the world around him, there's certainly a civil rights movement, um, but it is a very different uh, one and has less access to the... Um, the broad based uh, sort of swath of the American public. But Wilkie, as I think I may have talked about last time, is very attuned to it because he's close friends with Walter White, who was the head of the NAACP at the time. Um, and so he was had learned quite powerfully from White and from others around him, something like this view of the world, I think that you're, you're describing, um, some sense that there needed to be a way to knit together the forms of, you know, the different forms of, of, or the different groups that made up the American polity, right? And so in this way, he joined a number of sort of left liberals in these years who articulated a similar kind of vision along with um, black civil rights leaders. So I guess one place to look at this would be Wilkie's um, argument made in, of all places, the Saturday Evening Post, uh, generally a very conservative news magazine that reached millions and millions of Americans in, I'm going to forget the date, but um, it's in the in the notes of my book. He, and I, I think I mentioned it um, in, in one of the passages um, there. He he makes it, he writes an article called The Case for the Minorities, which is in some ways using an older language, but a similar kind of vision of anti-prejudice in some sense, right? Uh, and in some ways it was turned in a kind of psychological language as it often was in those years. Uh, but he's groping his way towards this vision that you have articulated. Um, I think the problem for him was that he a lot of this foundered, and I try to get at this in um, the, ch I think it's chapter 12, One World Barnstorming, where we're talking about chapter 11, where I'm talking about the the impact and the reception of one of, of the book One World, um, where he is struggling to reconcile this emerging sense of the world, right? This anti-imperial sense, this sense that that the that the chief one of the chief problems of the world that doesn't get enough attention in the United States are the interlinked problems of race and empire. Um, this never was really part of the public discourse in these years, the mainstream public discourse, and he's trying to force it into that uh, zone. But um, he, that he struggles to reconcile that with his other identity as a as essentially a capitalist, <laughs> as essentially somebody who speaks for what he would have, have embraced early in his career as free enterprise and free trade, right? And he, of course, comes to public life as a, a lawyer and, and a CEO of a, a holding company, a utilities holding company, and as a spokesman for anti-New Deal politics, too. Um, and I tell a complicated story about that. And I tell also a story about how his trip and the ways that he saw the world in the terms that you're 
laying out at some level, um, began to sort of loosen his sureties about this. And um, he struggles at the end of his life in the years, the year or so before his death, um, to, to try to find a new language to explain how he can, how the world economically can be, or be organized around terms using your ter using terms that do not align with what, what you call competition, right? He wants to find a way to um, sort of flatten those hierarchies, short of calling himself a socialist, which he feels is going to, well, he's not a socialist, he has rejected that ideal, and he also feels it has no purchase in American political culture, and of course he wants to find a role in the mainstream of American political culture. So that dilemma provides him with a lot, provides a lot of the tension in the narrative, I think, and a lot of the, for me, a lot of the interest in the story, but I get, um, but, and I think that that's him trying to work out those kinds of the problems that you've exactly suggested. Thanks for putting it that way. It's interesting to me. Wonderful, thank you. Are there further questions that we can bring in now? Joseph? And I think Suzanne, did you have your hand raised? Yes. Okay, we'll go to um, Joseph first, please, and then uh, we'll come back to Suzanne. Joseph, take it away. I think you're on mute, Joseph. You're on mute, Joseph. Yes. Winston also. Oh, Winston, did you have your hand raised? Okay, Joseph, you're on mute. If you just unmute yourself, and then you can. Um. There you go. I think I saw Suzanne raise her hand rather than the electronic hand. And if she'd like to speak first, because uh, I may take us off on a tangent. Oh, yeah. Then let's let Suzanne talk. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne? Mute. Very good. Oh. I was not insisting to speak first, but thank you <laughs> since okay, I got great. it now. Uh, um, yeah, I, I just uh, had one uh, quick comment, but um, you, uh, uh, Sandy, responded to it, and that is, um, <clears throat> yes, I, I very much agree with uh, the lady who spoke before. Uh, about this idea of differences. But we have today, and I think there is a, a chance, so it comes from the a small part, uh, this idea of diversity, which we claim all the time, you know, diversity in, in the school, diversity in the university, diversity uh, among people, but it remains in the talk. And maybe there is some kind of uh, uh, there is um, there is uh, it doesn't permit us to unify. It just gathers different kinds. You know, it's uh, it doesn't it doesn't move forward together, unified. It kind of only remains in the moment to collect diversity. And uh, I think that is another problem with not recognizing that uh, difference has to be a unifying factor. And I think that was said so well. Um, I had wanted to raise a different issue, and that was about the uh, when you in the last chapter uh, speak about the United Nations and its uh, inability today to to uh, <clears throat> really uh, gain momentum and power uh, over issues that it legally uh, has the right to rule on to rule on, but without any power. And mm. um, uh, I think uh, this idea of creating the UN, and this of course goes uh, after Wilkie's death, but um, the, he would probably have the same idea, but uh, uh, to create uh, uh, the United Nations. But uh, the, the problem in the United Nations is today, as we know very well, that it is powerless and that its structure uh, still permits control of the 
quote unquote four policemen uh, through the Security Council. So, and uh, there are other issues, but uh, it is interesting how uh, you uh, show that, um, uh, or, or it is interesting to see it right now in this moment uh, of time, how, um, like the Secretary General, tries to to rescue little powers that he has by saying peacekeepers cannot be attacked, you know, not even talking about all the other issues that are uh, at stake in, in Israel. So um, maybe uh, would it have led, in your view, <laughs> Uh, Wilkie, oh um, in in his in his travel, to uh, come up with uh, a different a different way of creating this unified government. If he had looked more in his travel, and he had made attempts to not only speaking to the major. Uh, representatives of nations, but to listen from the ground. And we have today a belief that non-governmental organizations could bring change to the power structure. And so I want to hear what you, it's kind of theoretical, but it is important, I think, to think along those lines. What can civil organizations today do other than what governments are doing on the top? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Well, okay. So, so you're asking me in some sense what historians we all call it counterfactual, which yes. uh, we uh, yes, <laughs> we both love and loathe those questions. To, to be honest <laughs> with you, Suzanne. Well, I'm a <laughs> sociologist, so <laughs> yes, right, you know the whole story, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I feel like uh, part of the reason that I was interested in Wilkie, or I became more and more interested in Wilkie as I worked on this, was in part because he didn't allow us to actually answer the counterfactual questions because his, and this may sound like a, a way of dodging your question and I'm sorry if it does, but and I'll, I'll keep going if I can, if I can, if I can get around to, to, to really answering it. But um, because, because so much of what I was tracking was a kind of attempt by Wilkie to try to mobilize these inchoate currents of thought and feeling. Right. right? And I mentioned this before. And I think that that's, um, both one of the strengths of his thinking, and this is something I've mused about a lot in the book and in some other writing I've done about this. So the, partially the strength because it 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 was able he was able to sort of um, dovetail with a, a, a world that was changing. But when that world, when the the opinion that gathered around this vision ten, uh, started to crumble or, or fragment, uh, he, he his uh, ability to drive it also began to wane. Um, the thing about Wilkie is, is that he never really did what you are suggesting. He never um, thought of himself as somebody who, for lack of a better word, was an organizer. He was not somebody who thought about um, transforming the world from the bottom up. He was somebody who thought about trying to harness the things he learned from people who had connections to the quote unquote bottom up and use it to shift and pull the um shift and pull the kind of currents of of public opinion at the top to some extent um and so when he traveled yes he did not go and meet um he met with journalists i think and some of those journalists were in connection with social movements or trade union movements or other places around the world particularly in the middle east where he encountered and he encountered some nationalist uh uh folks who were high up in their organizations, but who were um, what who were responding in many ways to a kind of insurgency from from below as we know it today. Uh, but in many ways, that was not his politics. He was trying to figure out how to uh, push and pull these kinds of debates at the top. Um, and I think that um, 
in perhaps damaged his ability to see how how one could sustain a long term um, process of keeping the pressure on for this um, for these ideals. But it's hard to know because, of course, he 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 passed away so soon in October of 1944. Where he would have gone? I mean, I think the even money, the 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 the. If you were a betting person, you would probably bet. And maybe I said this before that Wilkie was likely to have tacked back to the right in uh, after the war, uh, and have probably found a home amongst a more kind of conventional Cold War liberalism if he had he survived. I don't think we can be sure of that, but I think it's perhaps likely given that he was interested in finding the finding the the sort of position just to the left of the political center and trying to pull on it there. Um, and that was increasingly, of course, hard to do after 1948, as it as anybody in that position was quickly red baited. Um, so it would have been difficult to do that. But I do think it's important to notice that the position that he took in 1943, right after the Moscow conference, and this is on pages 267 and 268 in the book, right, was the one that many other um folks would have taken vis-a-vis -vis the formation of the United Nations, which he says that um, this is at the bottom of 267. He said there needed to be a true, quote, United Nations declaration prepared and signed by a council of all the allies. Otherwise, the drive for international cooperation launched in Moscow might degenerate, quote, into a mere alliance of four powerful countries for the ruling of the world. So in some sense, Wilkie saw this. He knew it was going to happen. It was before anyone was, but while the deliberations about the UN were happening behind closed doors in the State Department and amongst other places, and he's not the only person who saw this problem, of course. Many people who were, you know, people who were, would be involved with the Federalists, the United World Federalists, and with other critical organizations knew that, saw this too. Um, and worried about it and had you know plans for 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 trying to offset it. He was he wanted to go and kind of just push that that way. I you know, so that's that's just to say that he did receive and distill in his own way the kind of bottom up ideals. So that's that part of what you were talking about. Um, but I, I'm not sure about the longer term thing. It's so hard to know because in his time, there was not as much of an organized kind of civil society pressure. That was all sort of starting to bubble up right. around yeah. this period when there's all these sort of groups of, from different political perspectives, some quite radical, some quite middle of the road, just sort of, you know, church organizations and other people who would, uh, Protestant organizations in the United States, uh, you know, there's this group of liberal senators who are traveling around the country asking for a more representative world organization. And the politics are so complicated and, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on all that. Um, but I do think that, um, that this, you know, the formation of the United Nations is, launches a whole set of kind of politics and legitimizes a certain set of politics in some places and delegitimizes it in others, particularly the United States. And so that, you know, that's, that's, that's a, that's why I think it was interesting to see Wilkie as someone who launched ideas and not just ideas, but kind of, um, because because the ideas were not always his. He was latching on to ideas that others had and kind of giving, he was sort of a PR person for these ideas coming, you know, sort of latching onto the term one world, which of course was others too, um, and trying to make it attractive and to, and then laying it in the in the the kind of furrows of American life and hoping that it would be picked up by others who did find a way to 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 organize people to 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 come forward with these views. So I don't know, that's not really answering your question because, but I don't think he would have been able to, yes. to really answer your counterfactual. I don't think he would have been able to, to, to muster the forces of, of sort of interdependence or, or radical intervention. I think he was always caught on a kind of dilemma around interdependence too, right? And, and it goes right to the, to the, the problem that you suggested early on in your comment, which is this problem around um, diversity and unity, right? How do you, how do you bring those into some kind of workable arrangement? It's a, it's a, as you all know, a perennial problem for those who are considering thinking about this world, this vision of the world. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for the question, Susan. Um, now we will uh, tag uh, back to Joseph. Joseph, if you'd like to digress, uh, we're waiting. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my, um, my question, uh, I think, follows from from Suzanne's, um, uh, you you just 
you think that uh, Wilkie was not in a position to promote a bottoms up type of uh, international movement, and uh, I can understand that. Um, I think I should uh, start with uh, a thesis, and and uh, as, as Sandy, this will help you to uh, formulate a response. Uh, I think that Wend Wendell Wilkie <clears throat> uh, failed to perceive how ready the public was for more ambitious schemes of uh, post-war uh, international organization. Um, but I'd like to say in, an, in t at the beginning here, a little story. Um, I had a, a good friend, uh, an older man named uh, Norman Richardson, who after the war, uh, although he was a businessman, he uh, got admitted to Harvard uh, in a course on international relations. And I assumed that his motivation would be to, in, to encounter some of these more radical proposals like that of Wilkie and of Henry Wallace uh, and the World Federalists, because I, as a younger man growing up in the 60s, why, um, I am immediately attracted to uh, Wilkie's book and uh, also Wallace's. Um, and even, uh, and of course, to uh, projects of World Federation. But no, uh, Norman said his motivation was to discover why the United States had abandoned internet, uh, had abandoned an isolationism. And uh, this immediately indicated that his mental perspective was formed by this uh, very well established tradition in American foreign policy of isolationism, no entanglement with Europe and no involvement in Europe's quarrels. Um, stay behind the safety of our great oceans and uh, stay out of international affairs. Well, uh, thinking back uh, as a historian too, why um, I know that Franklin Roosevelt deeply feared that the United States Senate would reject, as it did uh, in Wilson's case, uh, would reject anything more radical than a revival of the League of Nations. Uh, so he was uh, particularly concerned that there should be no talk of uh, limiting sovereign powers of the United States. Um, now, yes, we all know that. And uh, we have to be reminded of it. Isolationism was the dominant culture at, by the in the forties and even later. Um, however, I know I have learned some things that are very anomalous. For instance, when the Senate came to consider uh, ratification of the Charter of the United Nations in July, nineteen forty-five. This was after the Alamogordo test, but before it was revealed to the world at Hiroshima, um, when they were basically operating within the isolationist tradition, um, they ratified the charter without a single reservation. And you may remember that when Senator Lodge objected to the to the Versailles Treaty, he he um, submitted a whole series of reservations. Mm. Uh, and uh, a little study of international relations that will acquaint you with the use of reservations by nation states to kind of uh, qualify their adherence to treaties. But there were no reservations to the charter. There was a, there was a, a such a strong um, determination in the political establishment and is in the public that this successor to the league would actually work. That just as it was promised, it would keep the peace. It was all that the, that the people had won from the long struggle in the war, as uh, Cordmeyer put it. Um, and um, um, that's, I think that Rose, the question is for you, 
didn't Roosevelt, was he, maybe he was overtaken by events. I think the poor man died at 63 and he's worn out by this terrible struggle uh, during the war after. But um, I think he could have dared more. I think he could have allowed um, even a re some kind of representative assembly to appear in the uh, in the uh, in the United Nations. Uh, he didn't have to stick so strictly. I know that Stalin demanded the veto. So did uh, the United States, and so did Britain. But but Roosevelt might have, I think, dared more. And um, so. Because he did not, we just continued with the sovereign state system despite the war, and we didn't learn anything really about how to establish peace um, even after a second lesson in the Second World War. And, and then we, uh, you know, it all, it all descended into the Cold War almost within a year. Yeah. Couldn't he, couldn't he have more... What's your sense of historical opportunity there? Yeah. Well, it was thank hard. you, Joseph. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that question, Joseph. It's hard to, you know, I think it's hard to tell from this period. Um, and so many different authors, historians, so on, have weighed in on this problem and kind of taken their own view of it. And I am by no means... Um, I by no means surveyed all of the available opinion, but I did, you know, try to look closely at this moment. And I think this moment is, as you say, a key, it's a key, it's a, it's a key sort of turning point, an inflection point. And I really date it to, to 1944. Um, it's funny because when I started this project, I thought uh, one of the stories I had in my head as a kind of critical historian of the United States. One way I thought you're supposed to tell the story of this is just to kind of track with, with Wallace and say that the Cold War doesn't really end until Wallace is finally, excuse me, start, until till Wallace is finally really banished. So, so you date the Cold War as ending, starting, I don't know why I keep doing that, um, in 1948 or so, right? And you think of the period between 1940 and 48 as a long period of possibility. And so I kind of brought that into my my own thinking. Um, you know, that was the story that I had from the sort of left liberal or even radical perspective on this period uh, and trying to say that, you know, there was always a possibility that someone like Wallace could have brought forward a progressive coalition that might have um, changed things. Um, and then when I ended up writing the book, funnily, I ended up arguing that actually um, the story of Wilkie is indicative of a very a very, um, the early rise of a much more nationalist ideal uh, that solidifies later into a Cold War vision in 1944. And that's why I call that chapter the Narrows of 1944. And I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about it. I mean, I think both of those things can be true in the sense that many different realities are operating for many different people. Um, when it comes to Roosevelt, uh, you know, I, I think thinking about that problem is difficult because it's always so difficult to tell with Roosevelt what is his conviction and his sense of the of of um what he believes and what is his sense of how to to operate as the sort of canny political operator that he was. So the 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 stories that I've you know the, the historians that I've followed in I think in 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 understanding where where Roosevelt went were that he essentially prejudged this idea and that he erected the, you know, sort of dreamed up the idea of the four policemen as a kind of hedge against his realism, a sense that he needed to uh, provide a vision that would fly for the great power struggles that he um, knew he was going to be involved in, in jousting with Churchill and Stalin, etc., de Gaulle, and that he hoped and, and the Chinese, and that he hoped to, you know, and this is very much his canny sort of political operation and trying to achieve some version of this. But, you know, I could also see an argument that this is kind of, um, this is his 
innate sense of the world, going back to his sort of patrician upbringing, his sense of the world as kind of being run by these, by figures like him. So I, I don't know exactly how to sort that out. I do think what I, what I take from your comment, and I think is interesting to think a little further about, is that, and I guess I would say that this is what, this is the, 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 the space that Wilkie was trying to inhabit, is the sense that, yes, actually, so much was in flux in this moment, this moment of 1943-ish to up to 1945, so much was up in the air that things could have gone many different ways, um, depending on who was able to sort of grab the reins of public opinion. And this is also why I am interested in Wilkie as a figure, because he tried to do this in ways that I addressed when I was talking about uh, what, what Suzanne had raised. And, and in doing so, you know, we could imagine a different way that this might have broken if, um, if perhaps, maybe this is the key, and as I'm thinking this through as I'm talking, um, you know, maybe this is the key. If, if, Will, if Roosevelt had found some way to allow a little more room for the, for the perspective that Wilkie inhabited, or maybe even the perspective that at one point his own um, undersecretary of state, um, what's his name, the other W in this whole story, um, why am I blanking on his name? Um, who was that? Say, say it. Jo Joseph, you're muted, though. <laughs> you're muted. Um, no, the the um, the 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 man who the the sort of very a patrician man who was who was driven out of public life for suspicions that he was gay. Why am I forgetting about his name? It, I was just reading it earlier today. This is what happens to sort of forget people's names. But anyway, he this kind of you know there are all these different versions of um, of polit of of this. Uh, internationalist vision uh, that tried to introduce versions of a more progressive vision into it, right? I mean, um, Wilkie's is one on a, a spectrum of various kinds of peoples. And I, I think you're right that 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 um, at some level, people came around to the idea of world organization, um, but they were less attentive to what that world organization, what the details of that might be. Um, and that they would have been willing to support something much more progressive, but they were also willing to support something a little bit more in line of what we ended up getting, in part because I think that um, all of the liberal political figures of this world, um, and Wilkie's part of this, but but pushing against it, really were cognizant of trying to satisfy the right um, and satisfy that old isolationist or um, non-interventionist. I mean, I think of it more as sort of a nationalist right. Um, who were in some ways perfectly happy to, to intervene and be unisolationist when it came to American empire and various other parts of the globe. But anyway, th you know, this was a this was a world that those folks, even on the on the in the liberal middle and even up to Wilkie to some extent, although he pushed against it, were trying to make sure they could bring into line in some force. And part of the story that I tell in 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 those last chapters is the ways that those all those different forces started to dovetail around a a vision that would that would that would cohere as the the the, the UN that you all we all know and lament some of its limitations. I think that um, it's interesting. I tried to read this through polls, and I'm, I'm kind of one of the ways that I narrate this is try to to sort of um, tell the story of all these um, intersecting events over these years and the way that polls start to register shite, uh, slight shifts in the, um, in the tenor of public opinion. So I kind of do that over these, these pages. Um, and, and I think you're right that had there been a, a way to organize elite political opinion around a more progressive vision, had there been a way to pull Will, uh, Roosevelt to the left a little bit, if Wilkie had been able to do that or someone else, um, then perhaps that would have, um, you know, that would have that would have changed the calculus a little bit in the in favor of this um, of this more um, uh, of this more progressive calculus. The person whose name I was trying to remember is, of course, Sumner Wells, one of yeah. the W's <laughs> in many W's. Thank, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Yeah. Winston, I believe you had your hand raised earlier, and then we'd go to yeah. Gail. That was the case. I'm wondering the extent to which the political elites of the day would have been more progressive given 
two or three factors which seem to have characterized the thinking of the day. Um, one has a bearing on uh, what uh, Palame uh, said earlier. We, we have never trusted anything coming from below up until today. Uh, the <laughs> We have elections pending for November and we are regretting something called electoral college uh, and its role in our uh, political life. But that was created precisely to impose limits on matters emerging from below and perhaps influencing elites in that fashion. Yeah. The second matter is we have never really accepted the idea of diversity. Although we use the term very often, we do not have an example of a unity that is not within itself diverse. So when we uh, pit diversity against unity, it is a historical and is without a, a real basis, as it were. Whether we go through physics or biology or chemistry or whatever be our constitutive roots, as it were. And the, the third uh, element, I, I, I hope we can uh, uh, bear in mind, is that Roosevelt was really a political realist, as you were you're sort of uh, wrestling with the idea. Yeah. Um, but before the Moscow conference, Roosevelt was very much thinking of a condominium between Britain and the U.S. for post-World War settlement. Um, he wasn't uh, about to risk certain things in the flux that he thought was emerging. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, the matter of class divisions seemed to him the most pronounced challenge that the uh, U.S. would face in the post-World War II world, represented by, by, by Stalin, as it were. Um, so I, my question to you happens to be this. Uh, I, I made all of these declaratory statements, and I'd be willing to uh, defend them in more in finer details. Uh, my question to you is, in what way would Wilkie have changed any of these uh, three features in our thinking in public life uh, to give a more progressive future, as it were? Yeah, good. So, so as I understand it, your your three 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 um, problematics here are yeah. uh, that we've never trusted the forces from forces from below. We've never accepted the, if I understood you correctly, we've never accepted the, the sort of true diversity of the world, right? The fact that the world is composed through difference. Yes, all, and, and not just the social and political world. I'm also thinking of the constitution of the physical universe, if we wish. Yeah. Yes. Right, and that's, that's, what, that's what made me see what you meant when you yeah. said, yeah. We need to understand that that's a natural principle that's of, right. of yeah. the world. Yes. Okay. So, and then uh, that FDR was a political realist, and um, and if I understand you to be saying that 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 FDR was as a political realist unable to grant the first two, right? Yeah. And that that I the first two of your conditions, your problem. Right. And I think that you know. It's interesting, right? And that goes back to a little bit about what we were talking about before, right? Which was, is where is FDR in all this? Um, to what extent is he able to dislodge himself from those conventions that you just suggested? Is his political realism simply because he's such a far-seeing politician and such a canny operator, or is it is it that he's he's basically, I mean, I said this before, he's basically a figure of the patrician um and and you know quote unquote conservative in this sense i would tend towards the latter as, as as i imagine you might in the sense that i think that um that uh 
for for Roosevelt, the world, he could imagine a reordered world, but only one in which the reordered world was one which the United States, in some sense, took over and displaced Britain as the kind of global hegemon, so to speak, um, but did so in some more perhaps romanticized, in his mind, democratic mode. Um, mm -hmm. There are several well places where he, he knows that World War II might, uh, where, he, where he comments that he knows World War II is potentially very explosive because it's going to, it, it has the potential to unseat and destroy European empire. And that in some sense, he doesn't mind that idea and that he looks at the world that the European empires have created and that he is um, unnerved by that world. But part of the reason he's unnerved by that world is because, like many Americans, he thinks uh, America could do it better <laughs> and do it more sort of small d democratic better. Wilkie inherits a certain amount of this kind of paternalistic vision of the world, but also pushes beyond it, in part because he's um, he's exposed to a more democratic, small d democratic from below range of opinion. Um I don't think he ever entirely steps out of that worldview, excuse me, but he um, but he does, I think, see his way to a more capacious vision of the relation in the world than uh, of this relationship to the world than than um, than Roosevelt does. And I think this is because he does and this, you know, go, tracks back to, to 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 my thinking around Suzanne's answer is that he is he or Suzanne's question that he is. He is trying, to, Wilkie is trying to figure out how to bring himself into alignment with what he senses around the world, bubbling up around the world from below. I mean, he has this great line, which I hope I'll be able to find, but which I've used a lot in his speech that he gives when he comes back from the, the, um, from the trip, it's called a report to the people. It's the title of the chapter that um, follows this. I think it's chapter 10. Yes. Um, and he is in this speech, which is over the radio, heard by millions of people, one of the big speeches of the war, forgotten now, but um, right up there in audience with many of the the speeches made by uh, public figures just behind the, the the big you know radio addresses that that, that Roosevelt would give in those years, um, where he says that what he's doing is trying to bring to the United States. Um, the voices, as he puts it, the voices of the East. And for him, that is a capacious category that includes everyone from this sort of great arc of 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 um, of the, the sort of soon to be decolonizing world from the from Egypt over to China. Right. This world that um, is uh, everywhere he goes there because he has an eye, he has an eye and an ear open to this kind of opinion is saying that if the world if the World War II is simply to bring um, another global hege hegemon, whether it's the Soviet Union or whether it's the, the United States, to displace the British, the French, and the Dutch, wherever you happen to be, then the then the world then the World War will have been um, a simple will not have been a world war. It will have been simply another struggle over um, a great power struggle. And he, I think, he senses this, and he's he's forcing his way to try to to say that to try to find a way. I mean, not to try to say it. He says it. Um, whether it has, uh, and, and this gets back to something I was saying earlier, which is then then his struggle his struggle begins to try to find a way to get Americans to see it, to Americans to feel it, the way that he has begun to feel it, and that is the great dilemma of his last the two last years of his life, the second half of this book, um, and and of one world really. Um, that that problem has been eclipsed in our story of one world because one world has largely been retold as kind of just a failure of idealism or something like that, and eclipsed by our sort of straightened um, stories about international politics and and and, and international relations um, all a product of this this narrowing that begins in 1944 and takes off and is solidified in the Cold War um, but really Wilkie's trying to is kind of create a strategic vision um, that is that goes beyond a, just a kind of um airy idealism right I think a strategic vision that says if we normalize our relations with the Soviet Union we can then, grant the powers of decolonization to reshape the world in a more democratic vision um, and to grant what we might think of as diversity, as that kind of um, 
ability of the small nations, as he puts it, to 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 better chart their futures in a more evenly distributed world. Not all of this um, sort of shapes up in a in a, in a kind of in, in the sort of manifesto way or the kind of fully formed way that one might like it kind of you find it in bits and pieces and individual statements here and there and in different ways that Wilkie um, articulates himself in the flow of politics in these years um, but that's what I think is happening there and I think that had he lived longer he would have continued to um press that position until I think he felt it <laughs> perhaps pushed him out of, um, you know, this is, I think, the big question again about Wilkie is whether he was um, most interested in his own, his ability to to to, um, to inhabit the political mainstream. Uh, he always tried to do that, um, and but he always tried to do it insofar as he could by pushing these ideas that we've been talking about into, into more into the public square, whether as he saw his abilities to do that declining after had he lived after into the into 44 45 46 would he have tacked his sails and trimmed his sails to become more of a cold war liberal i don't know probably in some ways but he might have still represented that ideal in 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 different ways as well um it's an interesting question i do think that he was trying to move beyond fdr in this sense Great. Thank you, Sandy. Um, we have one more question, I believe, from Gail. We have about 10 more minutes for discussion. Um, so, Gail, would you like to ask your question? And if anybody else has any final questions, please either drop them in the chat or raise your hand. Gail, please take us away. Hi. Um, well, the discussion about diversity interests me because um, the visible types of diversity, namely by gender, race, ethnicity, I think are um, very much um, dis under discussion and there's been a lot of progress in those areas. But the invisible kinds of diversity have not. And oh, and, and also nations uh, with the United Nations, for example, and um, you know the, the attention to, to Asia, as you you mentioned, you know, they have representation. but for example, by, um, by class, um, that is largely ignored, and especially intellectual diversity, <clears throat> I think, is ignored. So you have, you know, the, you know, supposed uh, representation of these, um, you know, representation by gender and and race in organizations, but the people selected are not selected according to their, you know, how most of the people in their group would maybe view things, but rather how integrated they are into the mainstream. So they're not, they, they don't have different views, if you understand what I mean. I'm wondering um, what attention, if any, uh, there there was to that. Oh, another um, point I'd like to make is that the there's a re recent crackdown on the First Amendment, um, and Julian Assange has mentioned that there's there's more crackdown on free spe freedom of speech now since he was arrested um, under the guise of uh, disinformation, cracking down on dis disinformation. But who is to decide what is disinformation? It's always those in power. It's inevitably always those in power. So anyway, that that's my comment and question. Mm -hmm. I guess um, you know, one thing that's interesting about, or at least was interesting to me about this period, and I'll try to make this brief, is that um about the period that I wrote about and the period when Wilkie has this has this moment of um opening for his uh, this moment of opening for his ideas, is the is actually the the ways that intellectual diversity, to use that, to, to, to pick up on that part of your, your comment, um, was wh where there was actually a, a kind of pretty surprising amount of room for intellectual diversity in this moment, say 
1942 through 1945, 44, somewhere in there. Um, that was what was so interesting to me about the war, is that ideas that had been um, considered off the table, entirely beyond the pale, suddenly were part of the discussion again, right? And I think this goes back to what Joseph said about, well, people really would have accepted a possible more progressive world organization than they got. Um, I think we can argue, we could argue about that and there's diff evidence in different ways. But I think what, what's interesting about this period is the, the sudden efflorescence of multiple perspectives that are suddenly finding their way into the public debate. Um, and Wilkie is in some sense a vehicle for some of these, right? He's a vehicle for ideas that would have been seen as entirely beyond the pale um, just four or five years earlier. The ideas that came out of the black freedom struggle, ideas that came out of um, uh, that came out of these sort of internationalist organizations that were had kind of been suppressed in the in the twenties and thirties. Um, and so he was in he was a kind of emblem for me of a kind of forgotten opened space in this period of intellectual possibility. And I don't know if diversity is quite the right word, such a contemporary word, but it is, uh, there was a, a kind of um, opening in this period that, that Wilkie was a part of. Did this opening have much to do with class? That's another important question. Certainly not on the part of Wilkie, as I've suggested, he was a capitalist. He was a kind of mainstream liberal in terms of economics, although his thinking on that, I think, was beginning to shift and unsettle a bit as he saw how much of uh, much of the, the power of European and American empire was solidified along economic lines and, and was proceeded from the power of capitalist economics. But he was a bedrock, that kind of a thinker. And I don't think he, um, while he saw himself again as a small D Democrat, able to, to sort of relate to lots of different kinds of people, he was not trying to challenge the American system along the lines of class. Again, he was not a socialist. Um, he was, this was not his politics. So that kind of diversity was a uh, continued to be, um, hard pressed during World War II. And in some ways, any figure who tried to advance that sort of position, I think, would only have success if they count they couched their opposition in terms that were acceptable or or at least challenged the mainstream on terms that were that were envisioned as kind of liberal terms. Um, and I'm thinking here of someone like A. Philip Randolph, um, who, who who was the the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union and an avowed socialist, but who also, you know, his great success in the war in the war years was threatening a march on Washington to uh, try to 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 offset the segregation of war facilities, and did so by um, by sort of pulling the Roosevelt administration back into line on a kind of loop they were able to counter that with a, with a sort of liberal uh, desegregation of public facilities but not a thoroughgoing commitment to a kind of understanding of the interrelations of class and race and the way that it shaped the war effort so that let me stop there because we're running out of time and i see mm -hmm. i see that simon wants to get in on that <laughs> yes if i may uh, thank you for the contributions you all have made um, and we are all struggling about how to bring about unity with a diverse world diversity and unity. We are all struggling with that, including the United Nations, where there's this veto power of the Security Council. How do you we think uh, this could be overcome? In other words, how could we bring unity in organizations, in diversity, including the United Nations, which is stopping us really making true progress for everything we need, um, including, you know, in our United States, we have uh, these uh, diversities and non-unities. Uh, so that's a real major problem. Uh, the world is diverse, as mentioned, in, uh, very clearly by Winston, among others, uh, and we need to bring unity. Any comments by both uh, uh, Sam, Samuel, Zip, and others would be very much appreciated and, and, uh, and made use of. Thank you. Well, I feel Sandy. 
use the, those comments to frame the close. Yes, and I can. I can. I can close there. Sure. Um, you know, I I feel um, ill-equipped to answer Simon's question in any way um, greater than you all can. I mean, you all are far wiser than I am on these problems of contemporary, the contemporary moment. Uh, you've followed it much closer than I have. Um, you know, I I just I just think I'll say that um, I hoped I hoped in in writing this book to to give a. Um, a kind of heightened and in-depth story of the dilemma that you lay out for us, Simon, you know, of the dilemma that so many of you have laid out for us. And to show that that if if you we think of this as our as a dilemma of our own times, it was a dilemma of previous times too. It was a dilemma of um that was really wrapped complexly into the politics of and politics and culture of a period that we have through our sort of more simplistic lenses, uh, told far simpler stories about. And by that, I mean the story, triumphalist story we have of World War II. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that that's true of our own times, right? We don't know what, we don't know what new possibilities could break out of the complexities of, of our own moment. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly struck by, um, and I will hope to learn from all of you in the next few minutes, you know, what's happened in the last month. When we last met, you know, Rebecca and Andrea were were telling us all about the possibilities for new moments uh, of of opening at the United Nations and, and pushing forward these ideas. And so, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what's happened with that and where it could be going, and has any any new wrinkles developed on that front that we might take hope from in the terms that you suggest, Simon. So, thanks everybody for your questions and for thinking about this with me. I appreciate it. Looks like Suzanne wants to get in. Just very shortly before you go, I I want to say uh, how much I enjoyed your book, how you. much it stimulates ideas, and uh, funny enough, the uh, Mr. Wilkie had the same birth date and birth date as my father, yeah. which also I found very interesting. But um, the the um, the references you use and give give a lot of indication of further book reading. Yeah. And I like that. But yeah. I wanted to say one other thing, and that was, uh, yeah, with regard, very quick, I think there is maybe uh, on the horizon the possibility that uh, the uh, human suffering of climate change worldwide has brought a kind of a unity of people around the world, though powerless at this moment, to uh, bring some new thinking or some new, new planetary or global thinking to yeah. um, uh, some of the issues that we all face. Yeah, I think that's, a hope. that's absolutely correct. You know, I say at the end of the book that I, that I think that we need to pick up the baton that Wilkie left for us, you know, so many years ago, 75, 80 years ago, but that that we need to do it on renewed terms. And those are the terms exactly, planetary, right? And, and those are also the terms like Winston says for us, right? That we need to think of diversity as not just human, but natural, but everything, right? We are all connected in this sense. And the interdependence that we live is, is something that we must start to understand um, in a more in this way. And, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe the, maybe we are just in the middle of a story, right? We're in the, I mean, certainly we're in the middle of a story, uh, that is, that is unfolding in ways we can't yet appreciate. And that, um, that, you know, as, as, as Joseph said, right, like, analogously to what he said about the, the 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 moment of flux in World War II, where more could have happened had things broken in a different way, had fig people figured how to put the push the levers in just the right way. Perhaps we're in that moment again, you know, who knows? It's hard to say. Once we get past this infernal election um, and, and into some other world beyond this ridiculous and constant story of will we or won't we go down a hole into, you know, fascism or something, right? We can we can maybe see the ground clearing of that if it goes the right way. If I think if it goes the wrong way, I think we're into a, into another problem altogether, of course. But I, you know, I, I hope that um, you know maybe we'll see things shift after that, and some kind of form of recognition of this kind of interdependence take a more take a more 
powerful political and cultural role in our understanding of the world. I certainly hope so. Well, thank you for your closing remarks, Andy, and uh, for your time, um, effort, and thought over the last two sessions. We all really appreciate it. Um, yes, I appreciate it's super it, important to have these. Yeah. Just to, to say thank you to everybody. Winston, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank um, you. The, 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 the tables will be turned. Um, <laughs> hope you're ready. Yes, indeed. I look forward to it. Wonderful. Okay, thank you everyone for today's questions. Um, they were very considered. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week, uh, next month. Apologies. <laughs>